Hi. Now, a quick search on Edwin Schrodinger on the web will probably get you two main search results, his equation and his cat. Now, the story of his cat is an interesting one and comes out really out of the implications of his equation. In this video, I want to discuss Schrodinger's contribution to the understanding of the atom in developing an improved model of the atom and it paved the way for a deeper understanding of the quantum world. I am going to discuss his equation. It is a central part of the contribution. But my aim here, as always, is to have my videos teach physics concepts in such a way that a high school student can understand it. So if you're looking for a deeper mathematical analysis of equation, well, that may be a subject for another video. But if you want a primer on his work without relying too much on the heavy mathematics, stay tuned. Now, before we go on, we need to quickly recap where we've come from. In the early part of the 20th century, in 1913, in fact, Niels Bohr introduced the first sort of quantum idea of the nature of the atom, or particularly how electrons behave. And he tried to give it a reason why electrons stay in discrete energy orbits without releasing energy. And he came up with the idea of really the quantization of energy levels of the electrons. And he suggested that the electrons, in this case, the hydrogen atom, were in discrete energy levels because they had discrete amounts of angular momentum. But the problem was it could only explain it in terms of hydrogen and he didn't really have an explanation as to why that occurred. Further on in the early part of the 20s, then we have Louis de Broglie. Now he suggested that the electrons existed as waves and he derived what we now know as the de Broglie relationship. That is the wavelength is equal to Planck's constant divided by the momentum. Now that means interestingly enough, of course, that photons of light can have momentum, but critically is that now electrons that have momentum as we classically think of them, but now have an associated wavelength. And he came up with the idea that they exist in discrete energy levels because they were like standing waves around the orbit. And if you have standing waves, you can have discrete uh, waves as a result, you can have harmonics at higher energy levels because they're in different resonances. And so what we have here is our understanding of de Broglie. But then is where Schrodinger where it comes in and he really asks two questions. And the first is if it is a wave, then can we use mathematical wa functions to describe these waves that exist in terms of the electrons around them? And therefore from this, can we extract information such as their momentum and their energy values? Secondly, can this function then explain all the orbits that the elect electrons exist, not only for hydrogen, but also for other atoms as well. Now, the beauty of equations is that they allow you to determine various features of what you're particularly studying. So in the terms of particles, you're familiar with equations such as F equals MA, the momentum equals mass times velocity, energy is equal to half mv squared in terms of kinetic energy and so forth. In other words, equations allow you to make predictions of how a particle behaves. And then the same is true also for waves. So what Schrodinger did, he started off with the concept of the conservation of energy. Now you all know that the conservation of energy is basically says that the sum of all energy is a combination of both its kinetic energy and the potential energy. And if we were to write that as a mathematical formula, we have a half mv squared plus v. Now here the v is another way of describing the potential energy. So when we looked at a quantum state, this electron that is a particle and wave duality, we can determine its total energy by looking at its kinetic energy and also its potential energy. Now half mv squared is something that you're familiar with, but in this case, this looks at, as a particle. How can we somehow incorporate the concept of the fact that we're dealing with a wave. And this is of course where we get de Broglie's relationship. De Broglie's relationship simply says that the wavelength of a wave is equal to Planck's constant divided by the momentum P. But we don't have momentum here. But you know the momentum is mv. And so another way of writing half mv squared is simply saying what we have is in this case P squared over 2m. That's the same thing. And now you can see what I have is that the energy is now described in the terms of momentum and its mass. And remember de Broglie's relationship says the momentum and the wavelength are intricately connected. And so now you can see we can embed the concept of a wave in this conservation of energy. And that's what Schrodinger did. 
But he also introduces the concept of what we call psi, which is basically called the wave function. Now, what is that? And I'll mention this right now. Psi is simply a sine wave. Now, one way I can write this wave is in terms of a sine function. And I, have, I call it sine or a times sine outside of kx minus omega t. Now, how is that? Well, we know what a sine wave is. This omega t tells us in terms of how its velocity is happening with respect to time. It's a sine wave that's moving. K changes the wavelength and therefore the frequency as well. And A changes the amplitude. And so now what we have here is a function that describes a wave. In this case, it's called psi and we call this the wave function. Now, strictly speaking, the wave function is a little bit more complex than that, but in essence, it describes a wave. And the beauty about this, of course, is that it also allows us to make predictions. It tells us everything about that wave, including the momentum. Why? Because the momentum is basically related to the wavelength. But what we don't know necessarily is a position. And as you know, a wave doesn't have a discrete position. It is actually a wave. Now, when he puts this all together, he gets this particular function. And you get E multiplied by psi is equal to negative h bar over 2m multiplied by the second derivative of psi with respect to the displacement x plus the potential energy multiplied by psi. Now, this is what we refer to as the time-independent Schrodinger equation. Now, it looks complex, but let me just really break it down for you. What he's really saying, look, is if I want to know the, the energy that the electron is allowed to have in terms of the psi here, that's what I want to work out. That's what I want to determine about my electron. Then I really have just two aspects that I need to use, and that is the kinetic energy, which is the first half of the equation, and the potential energy. So in other words, if I can find solutions to psi, I can determine the features such as the energy of my system. And that's the critical thing about Schrodinger's equation. Now, the beauty about this equation too is that this form of that we have right there is actually a wave equation in itself. In other words, it actually describes, at least in the mathematical sense, a wave. Now, what does a wave look like? Well, Schrodinger didn't know, others didn't know, but at least in a mathematical sense, this is a wave. And the other thing I want to touch on too is that this psi, if I took at all the possibilities of psi that we can have, and then we square that in terms of all the possible versions of psi, then what we end up is getting the probability of where this wave actually exists or where the electron actually exists. And we'll refer to that in a moment. So now what we now come to is the idea of a particle in the box model. Now, of course, our wave, that is our psi function that is described by in within the wave equation, isn't allowed to roam anywhere. It's within the confines of the atom. And so what we want to do now is look at that, what happens when we place a confinement in place. How can we make this in terms of a standing waves? How can we show that that we have is standing waves? And so what we have here is an analogy, which is referred to as the particle in the box. And what we do is now we look at it just in one dimension. In reality, Schrodinger's equation describes the electron wave duality in three dimensional space. But what we want to do is just look at this in a simplistic sense in a one dimensional space. And if we actually try to work out the solutions to give us the energy, we end up getting a formula that looks like this. Now, what again this formula looks like is quite complex, but let me just break it down for you. If you look at all the variables that are in that equation, there is only one variable there that can actually change, and that is n, which is the energy levels, that is the discrete energy levels. h bar, which is the first one, pi, 2 obviously, m, which is the mass, and l, which is the length of the box here that we have across here, are all constant. So what is this saying? It says that the energy of this wave that Schrodinger's equation describes when confined in a box is a standing wave of discrete energy levels. 
And so what I'm gonna do now is show you what happens to our waves when we confine them in the box. Now, the electron cannot exist outside the box, and so will we say it has no energy value outside the box. But inside the box, we can have it existing, but remember, it exists in terms of a wave, a standing wave. So when we do n equals one, we get the classic fundamental wave. That's the E value, it has discrete energy value. But if I try to increase the energy, the only way I can increase the energy is when n equals two. And, and as a result, we get a second standing wave. We get the next harmonic. And you can see we have a node right in the center. Then of course, if I increase that to three, I'm going to have two nodes in the middle. If we look at this wave, this psi function, and we look at all the possible psi functions and we square it, we get what we refer to as the probability of that. And that is Max Born's contribution. He looked at this and said, look, the wave that is Schrodinger's equation is describing is not a wave in terms of just in physicality, a wave, but a wave of probability. Now, let me explain what that means. So the first thing I'm gonna do is on the right-hand side, I'm going to place this axis. And I'm gonna see here, this is the psi x function and it's squared. And I'm going to just look at one. If we square that particular function, we get this. Now, what does that mean? It means that if I were to open up the box and look inside the box while this electron is existing as a wave, the likelihood of me finding the electron in a particular place would more likely exist in the middle and less likely at the edge. And that makes sense. At the very edge, it's very unlikely for me to find the electron at the very edge and certainly not outside the box. This is where the node is, but it's more likely to be in the middle. If I close the box and open up again, again, it'll be more likely in the middle. This is a probability graph. In other words, it's the greatest probability is in the middle. But now let's have a look at energy level two. If I square that, I'm going to get not that, but that. Now this is where it gets really interesting. That means if I open up the box, the likelihood of me finding the electron in let's say this box is greatest at these points here where the amplitude of this curve is greatest, but nothing at the edges and nothing in the middle. In other words, if there's an electron existing in that box, I will never find it in the middle if I were to open it up and look at it. Now that's a bit weird because electron seems to want to be able to be existing in any one place. If it wasn't literally just a particle moving around the box, surely I would find it somewhere, sometimes in the middle. But remember, this exists as a wave when we don't observe it. It only exists as a particle when we observe it. We say that the wave function collapses. What about when we increase the energy level, not from two, but to three? Well, it's not gonna look like this. It's going to look like this. And again, now what we get is we have these three antinodes of basically the peak, the likelihood, the probability of finding the electron there when we do observe it, and no probability in between, which is again, not intuitive we'd expect the electron to be able to exist in any place but that's because we have this idea the electron is a particle and then we just can't observe it no, no no if you don't look at it it's existing as a wave remember this wave particle duality is what it's doing naturally so in other words it's acting as a wave so it's acting as that yellow wave but the probability of finding it when we observe it when it becomes a particle is based on the blue graph now, of course, this is only a one-dimensional model. In reality, it's a three-dimensional model. And so what does that look like? Well, that leads us to an understanding of the concept of electron clouds. If we look at a three-dimensional, we get something called an electron cloud. Now, it's important to note, the electron cloud is not a physical reality in the sense that if you were to have some sort of super, super microscope and looking at that, and we don't have that ability, it's not you're going to see a cloud in that sense. This cloud is actually a probability function that allows us to say where is likely we're going to find the electron. So the thicker the cloud, so to speak, the higher the probability of finding the electron there. The thinner the cloud, the less likely to find the probability.
Now, if we took this one cloud here, this is the lowest energy level, n equals one, this is what the number here is. We have our energy level up here, which is how we can calculate using Schrodinger's equation. If we look at cross section of that, you get a graph that looks like this. In other words, this particular radius right here gives us the highest probability of finding the electron here. Now the fact is is that the cloud is looks like it's thickest in the middle but it's actually a little bit thinner at the edges because you're not going to find the electron right at the nucleus because of the way that the sphere works you're going to find that it's a certain distance away from the nucleus that you can find the greatest probability. But then of course it goes lower. Now interesting to note here is that the probability that is greatest is at a radius of 52.9 picometers. That happens to be Bohr's radius for the first energy level for hydrogen. But what Schrodinger's equation does is says, look, that's the likelihood of finding the electron there, but you can find a possibility of the electrons being further away or closer. It's just more likely to find it at that particular radius. What about the second energy level? Well, here now, like our particle in the box at the second energy level, where we had a space in the middle where you were not going to find the electron. In this case, you can see I have two spheres and we have a section in the middle where we are not going to find the electron. Again, this is all based on probability. So density here represents not a physicality, but the probability of finding the electron where we would try to observe it. Important thing is, is that this is a mathematical function. The electron is a wave. It's not buzzing around fast and fast and producing this cloud. No, if you were to observe the electron, you're going to find the electron there as a particle. But if you were to not observe directly the electron, then you're going to see it as a wave. Now, Schrodinger's equation, along with Pauli's description of what we call the exclusion principle, is that we allow the existence of other possible orbitals that also have the energy level of negative three vo electron volts. And so we have this particular cloud configuration here. And in this case, we have these sort of two dumbbells. Now in this case, I've only represented it in one axis, but in the actual fact we're going to have to other two sets here, one in the X, one in the Y, and one in the Z, so to speak. And so again, these are all negative three volts. And what we now get is orbitals. But the important thing here again is, is that these clouds represents probability. Now, what's interesting to note though, is that the fact that in the space here, we have nothing. So if an electron can be described in this particular uh, orbital, and the electron can be described in this particular orbital as the probability, and remember, this can apply to a single electron from, then how does it get from there to there with the gap over here? Now, if we go further, you can see here a quick setup of the different possible orbitals. These are all in one plane at this stage. So for example, we have energy level one over here. We have energy level two and three. You can see the spheres that are going out. And then of course I have the two dumbbells, so to speak, for the p orbitals, which are in this case only in that direction, but of course they can be also be in that direction and in that direction as well. And then we also have the d and so forth. And again, you can see they have these specific shapes associated with them. Remember, they are probability functions. So what can we really conclude here? What is the significance of Schrodinger's equation? And this is the key point I want to leave you with after taking you through all that. Number one, we have a mathematical model to describe how the electron behaves around the nucleus. Secondly, this particular model can also apply to other atoms. So now I've just talked about hydrogen here, but Schrodinger's equation allows for the prediction of the electron cloud in terms of other atoms as well. Thirdly, along with Max Born, we now have Schrodinger's equation that gives us an understanding of the probabilistic nature of the electrons around the nucleus. And finally, it allows us to make the connection to what chemists already know, so that we have certain orbits around the atom, and this provides the basis for our understanding of the different orbitals that exist. So we've got our S and P and D and so forth. I hope that has helped you a little bit about the nature of Schrodinger's equation. My name is Paul from Physics High. Please like, share and subscribe, put a comment down below. Certainly this may raise a whole bunch of other questions and still some things that are unclear, but I'm hoping that it's given you a little bit of a deeper insight of the importance of Schrodinger's equation in the understanding of the quantum world. Take care.
Bye for now.